So welcome to Science on Tap. This is my first time here too, and uh, boy, this is this is a tricky business managing all the back and forth here. I'll do my best. If I'm blocking you constantly, you can't wave at me, and I'll try to do my best to get out of the screen. But I also realize that some of you can't see at all, which is too bad. But I will do my best, and we'll try to get this uh, online. Sometimes you can look at the screen uh, at your own at your own leisure sometime later. All right. So today's brief lecture. Okay. What what is strength? I'm not going to tell you what string theory is in 20 minutes. But I am going to tell you something about it, and especially going to tell you something about its history, which I think is as interesting as the physics. And we can talk about the physics during the question session. But in very short order, what is string theory? It's a theory of rubber bands. That's what it is, a theory of rubber bands, except that that's a little more interesting than that, because you throw in special relativity. That's Einstein, 1905. And then you throw in quantum mechanics. That's uh, people like Heisenberg and Pauli and Schrodinger, 1927. And so spectacular things start happening. And uh, so how how did this how did this simple beginning lead us to science on tap that's packed to the rafters? Well, it's a fascinating history in part because nobody set up to invent string theory. What they were working on at the time had nothing to do with a set of rubber bands. And they weren't even trying to do what people try to do with string theory now. They were trying to solve the problem of quantum gravity, Einstein's great conundrum, or that the theory of all particles of nature, which they call the theory of everything. So how did this theory come about? Where did it come from? How has our understanding of it changed over time? And um, how has it succeeded and failed? Uh, what have its spin-offs been? How is it used today? And why in heck is there so much controversy over some theoretical physics that doesn't have anything to do yet uh, with data? All right, where did the theory come from? The theory came from data. Data. People were interested in understanding the particles that make up atomic nuclei, protons, or other particles like them. And here's a little bit of terminology for later, hadron. Hadron is simply a type of particle that has what we call the strong nuclear interaction as part of its features. The proton is one example. And so you can take protons and you can bang them into each other and try to figure out by how they scatter off each other what they're made of. And this is what physicists do for a living. They, uh, they, they just you know, kind of do this again and again and again. And they, and they, 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 or sometimes maybe they take a different particle, like a, a pion, Hadron, and maybe they slam that against a proton, and they see what happens. Okay, on we go, a few of these. You know, different things happen each time, and after a while, um, you have some data, and then you plot it. Okay, there's a plot. Um, nice plot. Uh, not, very, not very informative, per se. And indeed, it wasn't very informative to the scientists when they first looked at it. It was kind of uh, weird looking. The data points, by the way, are the dots. The lines are someone's attempt to make sense of the dots. And this is the way physics is done. You, 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 get, you start with data, those are the dots, and you try to come up with some sort of formula or fit uh, that, that would at least attempt to explain the data. And this data, as, as, the, as these experiments were done in the 1960s, was very unusual looking. Um, it was uh, not like anything anyone had seen before, so they really didn't know what they were looking at. And indeed, no one could really fit the data until one day Veneziano famous physicist who was quite young at the time, he's still very active, wrote down a formula, just out of his head, that fit the data. Well, the next question is, after someone is successful that way, the question is, well, gee, why, why did that work? And it wasn't very long before two well-known physicists, Nambu, who was a professor at Chicago, and separately Susskind, who was quite a young man at the time, uh, both realized that if you took strings, quantum relativistic strings, that is, and you scatter them off each other, like that, okay. you get that formula. Okay, well, all right, you scattered protons off each other, you got this data, and then somebody cleverly thinks of this formula, and then you realize that you would get that formula from scattering strings, what do you conclude? You conclude, well, maybe hadrons, protons and pions, and all those other particles, maybe they're strings. I said, yeah, okay, so that's the birth of string theory. Now, that wasn't the only game in town. There was also a theory running around that had the idea that maybe there were quarks. And maybe protons and pions and other things were little bags containing some quarks held together by gluons. And these theories uh, were uh, in competition for a while. But um, first, more data came in. And the string theory wasn't agreeing that well with them as it had initially. 
And there were other problems. People were developing the string theory, and it didn't really quite work right. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But the kicker really came in 1973, when Pollitzer, and separately Gross and Wilczek, and I can tell you a story about that sometime if you'd like, um, <laughs> separately Gross and Wilczek came up with, uh, proved, essentially, that a theory called quantum chromodynamics, it's a theory of quarks and gluons, a particular one, has the right properties to match the data at least some of the data, in particular the highest energy data that was available at the time. And it really worked. And string theory really didn't look like it was going to work. And so the conclusion was that hadrons, in fact, are not strings. They're bags of quarks and gluons. And that was the end of string theory. Not for very long, of course. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, a bit more terminology. Quantum chromodynamics, the theory of quarks and gluons, is a particular example of what we physicists call a quantum field theory. And I mention that because quantum field theory is going to come up again and again, and because what I really do for a living is quantum field theory. Um, now, quantum field theory has a nice uh, acronym, QFT. So whenever you see QFT, think, OK, quantum field theory, OK, that, an example of that is quarks and gluons, and that's what Matt Strasser does for a living. OK? So we'll move on now. OK, so that was the end of string theory as a theory of hadrons. But it didn't take very long for people to realize that some of the problems they were having with string theory, when they were trying to make it work in the first place, actually could be viewed as features rather than bugs. So first of all, there were all of these particles that, they, that didn't agree with the data, that were very, very light. In fact, some of them were massless. It was a pain in the neck. Except that there are, if you take Einstein's theory of gravity and you're trying to make a quantum version of it, it would have a massless particle in it called a graviton. The graviton is to gravity the way photon is to electromagnetism. It's the same idea. Quantum mechanics plus electromagnetic fields gives you photons. Quantum mechanics plus general relativity gives you gravitons. And it turned out that the strings, the, well, they kind of looked like maybe there was a graviton in there. Well, it didn't quite work, but then a little bit of souping it up, super strings. OK, that was better. Now, it still had a problem, because unfortunately, to make super strings give you gravitons, they had to be in more than four dimensions. Now, four is a careful counting, okay? Three space plus one time. Every time I give you a certain number of dimensions, I'm including the time. So four dimensions is what space-time physicists live in. And uh, it's not good if your theory is in more than four, at least not when you think about it the first time. But in fact, it wasn't very long before people realized that actually this too might be a feature rather than a bug. Because if you take the dimensions and you curl them up, and I'll talk about what that means in just a second, but if you do this and get, make them too small to see, then magic starts to happen. Because what you realize is that instead of just getting gravitons, you get gravitons and photons and, well, things like photons and lots of other particles too, including possible things like, possibly things like electrons and quarks and so forth. And so very quickly, you gain the idea that, well, just because of the extra dimensions, or in part because of them anyway, Maybe all the particles of nature are superstrings, and the extra dimensions are part of what determines exactly what types of particles we have in our world. So this is a very interesting idea. You just have to figure out precisely how the dimensions got curled up, and you would then predict exactly what the particles of our world are. OK, nice idea. Um, all right, what does it mean to curl up a uh, dimension? Uh, here is a two-dimensional thing. That is to say, if you have an ant sitting here, it can go up and down, it can go left and right. That makes it two-dimensional. Let's uh, curl up this little thing into, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry, just a second here. One more bit of terminology. When physicists like to curl things up, they have to have a fancy name for it, so they call it compactification. <laughs> and how do you take something and compactify it? Well, basically, you, you, you wrap it up into a cylinder. OK, it's still two-dimensional. I mean, you can see it, right? One dimension this way, one dimension that way. But then you, um, you put it in a closed dryer for a very long time, and it shrinks down. And um, did, I bet some of you didn't see that. So I'll, I'll just write it down. OK, here we go. Yeah, we're going to make, did, we've, we've made it compact. Now we're going to make it small. OK, now as far as you can tell, that's one-dimensional. But I tell you, there's a second dimension in there. And there, there are effects of that. And I, if someone wants to ask a question about that later, I can tell you why it might be that you get lots of different types of particles if you just start with one. Why graviton, in, when, in, after compactification, might give you lots of different particles afterwards. OK, so now this is great. Now we have a proposal not just for 
a theory of gravitas, but a theory of all the particles of nature. And that proposal, therefore, qualifies as a candidate theory of everything. This is not a term I particularly like. Uh, it's not a theory of beer. And it's not a theory of television. And it's not, not a theory of a lot of things. So um, it's a bit of an arrogant term. I prefer um, that we uh, use a theory of all particles, forces, and space-time. That's not exactly a, uh, well, that, that's a very impressive title uh, as well. So let's just stick with that. Um, OK, good. 